Hello everyone, welcome, welcome back. I am Chris. This is You Buy We Rush donated request for Q&A session for non-Muslims about Islam and politics. This is, is it, I keep saying Sheik Uthman Ib Farouk. We were just talking about ISIS. Well, I mean, he was. I Well, yeah, I kind of was at the end too. Yeah. yeah. You can always watch part one. I didn't really, you know, I wasn't, yeah, it was nothing. I, I, it was just, you know, blame him, okay? I was talking about it because of him. So before we get started, there's a thanks button on the channel. You can donate, you don't have to. Subscribe if you'd like to, you don't have to. Be very nice if you did. And if you don't wanna do any of that, give me a thumbs up, that helps. Let's get into part two. Uh, just now you pointed out that Al-Qaeda wasn't formed in Iraq. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq pre-Saddam's war. There was Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and other places, but not in Iraq. Alright, I'll just talk about that. Google it. it Alright, come on. What are the more other questions? We're still here. We didn't even go over here. Yeah. Iraq. Uh, Iraq was a very secular country in the time of Saddam. Um, <clears throat> it was also highly educated. Um, Iraq's foreign minister was Christian, the, the ministry was pretty mixed. Uh, it wasn't a great place to live, don't get me wrong, I I'm not supporting Saddam. But what I am saying is, what was the reason for us to invade? Just because he was a bad guy? There's a lot of bad guys in the world, just because they don't have oil, we don't invade them. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then if you do invade, you have to kind of leave things the way you found them, otherwise, like, like we come here, if we break all the windows and stuff before leaving, your school's gonna be like, hey, you gotta go fix that stuff because you should leave it the way you left it, when you found it. Well, you can't go into a country, take out the army, take out the infrastructure, bomb that crap out of it, carpet bombing, oh yeah, that's a great idea, and then be like, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you guys killing each other? Well, because they're trying to get that one piece of bread. <laughs> so, anyway, I digress. More questions. Do you have to have a beard? That's a question. Or what's the significance with the beard? Come on, you must have something. Like, should I ask? Go ahead and ask. Yes. But you don't think there was a problem in Syria before any invasion? Sure there were. Okay, so let's, let's put it this way. Um, every country has a problem. No country is perfect. Every single country will have a problem. the the severity of that problem will always come from a political reason uh, different religions that are you know bumping heads for whatever reason again could be different religions bumping heads based on what a politician has said um, could be race could be different cultures could be uh, money class in terms of people with higher wages. I, the, every country is dealing with something. It's just that some aren't as as uh, the, the the problem doesn't shine as bright in maybe um, Canada. Does Canada actually have any problems? I don't think they do. Canada's all nice and shit. <laughs> but like Canada has problems. I don't know what they are. They would know. But their problems wouldn't be broadcast as, as much and as loud as say a problem in uh, Syria where you know there's conflict or there's uh, a corruption or blah blah blah. Not saying that Canada doesn't have the same thing but you, you wouldn't hear about it as much. All countries have it is basically just what I'm saying. Do you think we have racial tension in the U.S.? Do you think we have problems between different communities? Yes. Right? But things are still controlled, right? We're not out in the street banging at each other, right? But now if China invaded here and took out the police force, took out the military, took out the SWAT team, took out everything that keeps order, then we would have those tensions blow up as well. 
We would have race wars, we would have, you know, communities against each other. Don't think we're above all that. You know, we, we've done this kind of, maybe you guys are maybe too young, and I am too, but Rodney King and the riots in LA, and if you look at what happened in different places, you know, it, it's, it's all you need is a spark. And human nature takes over. What I'm saying is, in the Muslim countries, uh, when things are functioning wise, there is no problem. But when you take out a government, when you, when you bomb the hell out of a country, those minor problems are going to blow up and become big problems. And it's always politics. Why is Russia in Syria? Why is America in Syria? Why don't you let the Syrians deal with themselves? Let, let it fix itself. Because there's politics, there's oil, there's dominance. And the world's playing chess. And the board right now is the Middle East, unfortunately. <coughs> Anything else? Come on, those people that haven't asked questions, ask some questions, it's all right. Go ahead. So you talked about like the five pillars of Islam, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess what I was hearing is those are like the five practices that you guys, um, I guess, uh, or learn from the Quran, mm -hmm. but is there like a central belief, I guess? From sure. The so the first pillar is that central belief. Mm -hmm. The central belief in the Quran is that we solely believe in only one creator, one God, Tawheed the belief in one deity that is the creator of everything. We don't believe in any kind of polygamy. No, I mean, uh, polytheism, sorry. Uh, for example, uh, I believe polygamy, but anyway, uh, polytheism. So, so we don't have any uh, worshiping a, a, a animal because that is a representation of God or God coming in a human form or God splitting himself into three and then coming back together like the Transformers or, or we don't have any of those kinds of beliefs. We have a very purely monotheistic belief and that's the main belief of Islam to believe in that one creator without ascribing any partners or without taking what's due to our creator and giving it to somebody else. See, in Islam we think of it this way. If you go to a, a, a statue or an idol, and you go worship that idol, but that idol didn't make you, that idol didn't feed you, that idol didn't create the universe, that idol, even if you think of it to be a representation of something, you are taking what's due to the creator of the universe and giving it to somebody else. And that's a cardinal sin. This is one of the biggest dhulam or oppression, is that what we, what we call in Islam shirk, associating partners with Allah. That's a core belief. I mean, think of it like this, right? You, as a person, and everybody here, has some kind of a relationship with God, right? Well, even if you don't believe in God, when that plane starts shaking, you're like, oh God, oh God, oh God, right? So you're praying to somebody, right? So who is that somebody? Is it a man? Is it a blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy who looks like he's in a rock band? Is it a, a monkey? Is it a, is it a fat guy that you go rub the belly for luck? Who is that God, right? We believe in that core principle that that creator, without giving him any human or created forms, the one that everybody has that connection, the one who created all of us, the one who feeds and has that personal connection with all of us, that's the one we worship, without giving any human or our own idea to him. What do we know about that God? Is the book that he sent to us, the Quran, and those that came before it, like the Bible and the Torah, who we believe are all from the same God. Now, Bible, as we know, historically has been switched up, changed a little bit. King James came and did his little thing, and you know you had many different. Like if you look at a Catholic Bible today, and you look at a Protestant Bible, there are different numbers of chapters, right? But the Quran, we only have one Quran. Whether Shia, whether Sunni, whether this, whether that, there's only one Quran. We all believe in one Quran. So we believe this is the last message, and it's been preserved the way it is. And we can show that. We have brothers here that memorize the Qur'an. We have people in San Diego that have memorized the entire Qur'an, front to back, chapter to chapter. In Ramadan, you guys are all welcome to come to the mosque. You can hear, in every mosque across here, we're gonna have people from their memory reciting the whole Qur'an, front to back. I would like to challenge, or openly, this video, I'm putting this out there. Show me somebody who's memorized the whole Bible, word by word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. The Pope? Nope. Farwell? No. Nope. No way. I can show you little kids that have memorized the whole Quran. That's how we know the original message has been preserved. Alright, more questions? I'm getting good questions here. I'm actually proud of you guys, man. This is pretty good. First, I was getting kind of a little disappointed, but you're making a comeback. 
Yes. When you go to a mosque, is it, you're really just preaching, or is it also you guys have rituals? Sure. So in a mosque, you have the ritual prayers, where you actually, in congregation, pray the same way that Jesus prayed by putting his head to the ground. So we have that prayer. And we have on Fridays, like a sermon. And other times, we have lectures, we have discussions, we have classes, we have all kinds of activities. We have food. Um, so mosques are not just for preaching. Um, there are five-time ritual prayers. There are weekly services. And then there are other classes. Like we in our mosque, we have a class about the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We have classes about how to memorize and recite the Quran. We have classes where we discuss the lives of the Prophets. We have classes to discuss Islamic sciences. We have sometimes dinners, on, like on Thursdays, just for the community. Come together, have some food, sit and talk. And all non-Muslims are welcome. So. Right, that was an easy one. Go ahead. That's a very cool concept. Especially if you're opening it up like that to allow other people to come in, non-Muslims, to come in, you're allowing them to experience... I mean, look, it's it's hard to... to not... What am I trying to say? It's hard to have someone come in and then you, you know, break bread with them, you, you, you eat with them, and... If they've come in, then you know that they're not coming with an attitude or a negativity. Now, they, they might come in with some, you know, like, mm, okay, I'll listen to them. But the fact that they're there is always a good sign. The fact that they were open to coming in. And, of course, I don't know many people who don't like to sit around, have a meal, and then you just talk to somebody. You just talk to people, and you just kind of, you know... And you could talk to them. It, I, I'm going to guess it doesn't have to be just about you know the religion aspect. It could be just about life. And that conversation, just about life, your family, this, that, might cause that person to want to come back the next week. And then, again, interact on a different level, you know, where it's no longer just... Hey, how's the family? It's so what goes on here? And then, you know, but it's a very cool that it is open like that to everyone. I'm not saying that, you know, Christian churches aren't open like that. I, I wouldn't know. But I would think that they probably aren't inviting you to eat if you're not a member of that congregation. Um, what is the number one issue that Muslims face in this country? And Trump. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I know it's a pretty obvious question. Well, oh, that's a good question. What is detail? I mean, what is detail? Uh, to be honest with you, the number one issue that we face, in my opinion, may be different from somebody else's opinion. Right? So this is an opinion. Different between fact and opinion. In my opinion, the number one problem we face is a lack of unity. That we're not together. Uh, working together on many things. Everybody's kind of in their own little silos. Uh, and that's because the Muslim community in America is very diverse. Some are born raised here, some are just coming from other countries, some speak one language, some speak other. Geographically, we're pretty spread out. So this is a problem that I see. Um, and the root of a lot of the problems we're facing is definitely xenophobia. You know, when, when you have a, a Christian who is believer in Christ, go out and, uh, and, and commit a horrible act of terrorism. Like in Norway, where there was a man who declared a crusade, a crusade with a cross, wrote a 1,500-page manifesto talking about why he wants to initiate a crusade to stop the Muslims from coming to Europe, and then went and shot 69 kids and a bunch of other people and blew up itself. Nobody called them a Christian terrorist. Nobody came to each one of you who are Christians here and blamed you for it or asked you to apologize for it. Right? But we as Muslims get blamed for the act of every single Muslim, whether he was not even a practicing Muslim. He could be just some nut. You know, nobody kills innocent people unless he's crazy. No sane person does that. But nobody calls them. Timothy McVeigh goes and drives a truck and blows up the uh, IRS building and kills all these people. But nobody says, 
What church did he go to? You know? But if a Muslim who's never even been to a mosque goes just completely nuts and just suits people, suddenly it's like Al-Qaeda and Quran and every Muslim and any Muslim that he may have called in his life is going to be now taken at attention and all that kind of stuff. And nobody thinks that these are individuals. So these are this kind of xenophobic ideology that we're seeing <coughs> trying to stop mosques. You know, we need a place to pray. You know, if you don't have mosques, we're going to pray in the middle of the street. <laughs> you don't really want that, right? The traffic's going to be horrible. So why not have mosques? If you can have churches, you can have synagogues, why can't you have mosques? You know, so these kinds of xenophobic ideas are, are a big problem we're facing. So, Trump, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Can I ask a second? Go ahead. I'm very ignorant when it comes to Sharia law. Sure. And my question is, um, do most Muslims reject Sharia law? Is it part so, of the Quran? Or? Great question. Uh, first thing, what is Sharia law? I think this is a big problem that we see, uh, and this is not something that's an accident, but there is actually a movement, like in Indiana and Idaho, to stop Sharia law. Who's calling for Sharia law in Idaho? It's hardly any Muslims in Idaho, right? Uh, this is all xenophobia, right? Sharia law is an Islamic method of governance. And all we know in the West about Sharia law is cutting hands and cutting heads. But that's not what Sharia law is all about. Sharia law means the law that is based on the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet. And every Muslim in, in their faith believes in the Quran and what's in the sayings of the Prophet. So we all believe in it. But now, what does Sharia law mean? This is the place where people get misty or muddy or whatever. Sharia law has to do with governance through justice, through making sure that you have prevention instead of cure. For example, in Saudi Arabia, you go to Saudi Arabia, and, and I've had done this, you know, you, you could leave your wallet somewhere and you come back and it's still there, you know. You, you could leave, like I have an uncle who left his briefcase in a taxi that had money, that had his credit cards, everything. The taxi driver drove around looking for him to give it back to him. And it's not because Saudis are any better people than us, but because if the fear is that your hands are going to get chopped off, you're not going to do the crime. So Sharia law is about prevention instead of cure. What do we do in the U.S.? We're like, ah, you know, let them commit the crime. And then what happens? Some little kid does some, you know, misdemeanor somewhere. He gets arrested. He goes to prison. What happens in prison? Uh, and I, I used to give lectures in prison, so trust me, I know. You know, you have to hook up with a gang. Either you're going to be with the Sureños or Nortenios, or you're going to be with the Aryan Brotherhood or the Black Gorilla family. Now you went in for some minor uh, crime. Now you're having to stab somebody or becoming somebody's bride, and you don't want to do that. So <laughs> it really becomes worse and worse. You know, you breed criminals. There is no. We also have a thing where if I were to find a wallet in a taxi, I open up the door, I get in. Hey, there's a wallet here. Pick it up. I could look at the ID and I could say, I'm going to return this wallet to this person. Then I could flip in and find their cash and I could take it close the, put the cash in my pocket or in my wallet, get their ID, and then go to their place and leave it at their house or leave it here, leave it there. What I did, even though I stole their money, was a kind gesture because I returned their wallet. Maybe they had credit cards in there. Maybe they had uh, their social security card. Maybe they had all these other things in there. Yeah, but I stole their money. Yeah, but it's kind of a reward. It's like, are we, is that what we want to do? We want to reward people for returning a wallet but taking the money? Look, I was walking out of a store one time and I saw a guy drop a bill. And he got in his vehicle and drove off. And I, I saw him and I was trying to stop him and he just, he didn't see me. But he drove to the end of the parking lot and he stopped because there was another car there, his buddy. And so... I went over and I picked up the money and it was all crumpled up and I thought it was just a bunch of things and got in the car and I drove over to him, got out and I said, you drop this and I handed it to him and he took it and he looked at it and he unfolded it and it was just a $1 bill. I, I had, honestly, when I looked at it, I didn't know if it was a bunch of wadded up cash, but I did see a one and I thought in my mind that was a $100 bill and saw the guy. So I just went over and he goes, well, why didn't you just keep it? And I said, well, it's not mine. And I thought it was more. And he goes, do you want it? And I was like, no, it's yours. And I just left. 
And the guy, he was over there talking to another guy in this car, and the guy goes, well, that's nice. That's stupid. You should have just kept it, though. And it's like, is that what we is that what we want to do? We want to reward people for, you drop money, and you want to reward me for taking it it's not mine if i drop cash on the floor on the on on the ground and i'm leaving you may it could be a dollar but maybe i'm going to pay a bill and i need that dollar i can't i can't be short that dollar because now i got to go get a dollar you know it's just the consideration of this wasn't mine it was yours here you go but that guy was just like why don't you just keep it it's like you know what next time buddy if it was you i would but of course that next time would probably be a hundred dollar bill and i'd feel terrible then i would want to give it back to him rehabilitation in prison and you it's know? a for-profit system which is a really big problem and that's another problem prisons are for profit so their idea is to keep you in your probation laws your parole laws are made to bring prisoners back so what does that do it develops a system where you put people together in a horrible environment, run by criminals, and what do they do all day? Work out, get stronger, and make schemes and plans and network with criminals. And you think they're gonna come out and become better citizens? You know, you got tattoos all over your face. What kind of job interview are you gonna go for? So this is one type of system. Islam is a different system. Just because they get tattoos on their face doesn't mean, and they've served probably, you know, 15 years for attempted murder doesn't mean they cannot become an investment banker. No, you're right. No, I take that all back. Yeah, they can't. Islam system, you make the law such that innocent cannot be persecuted. You have to have witnesses. You have to have clear evidence. You have to have a, a system that governs to make sure the innocent are not punished. And those who do break laws, and again, there is checks and balances. If somebody's underage, they're not able to know right from wrong, they're not, uh, they have an puberty, they don't know, then they're not held accountable. If somebody's insane, they have mental issues, they have mental judgment problems, they're not held accountable. Somebody's sleepwalking, somebody's an accident, somebody's stealing out of starvation, they're not held accountable. But if somebody's out stealing big amounts of money, we're not talking about candy, anything as small, but somebody's out robbing, carjacking, you know, breaking into houses for fun, that person gets a punishment, such as a hand cut, that makes an example that nobody ever does that again. You know? So that is the essence of Sharia law, to have peace and stability in society. And once you look at that, then every Muslim believes in that. Thank you. Cool. That was the call of prayer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's see it then. <laughs> the fourth one there, <laughs> no, sorry, it's really loud. When I went to Morocco, I just found out that it's frowned upon to um, stop the Adhan. So uh, I had to just turn it down. Hey, I think we're good. Any more Any questions? More questions? So I have like one, one question on like what you guys believe on heaven and hell and how to get it. Sure. Done. Great question. Uh, <laughs> so because it's about the afterlife. Really. Now, when we talk about heaven and hell, being raised in America and going through a lot of churches, there is a difference between the Islamic idea of heaven and hell and the Christian idea of heaven and hell. We believe in heaven, no doubt. We call it Jannah. And we believe in hell, it's called Nar. But these are places of reward and punishment for those who do righteous deeds or evil in the world. But they're not so much like what we see in the Bible. We, we don't really see that the devil is not going to be ruling hell. He's not a ruler or anything, you know. So the idea is when somebody does good, they go to a place, which we call Jannah or heaven, where they will live a blissful life forever, ever and ever, right? Because humans were meant, even if you think of the way you think, you always think, about the future. You don't think, okay, I'm just going to finish tomorrow and then it's going to be nothing. Humans were made to be like that. And that's why Allah made places for reward and punishment. And heaven is a place that in the Quran, it tells us and the Prophet told us that no eye can imagine, no ear has heard, that can hear, no intelligence or mind can think of. It's a whole different level of existence. There are similes given to things that are in the world, like rivers and houses, but in reality, it's a whole different uh, state of being. Hell is the same thing. We talk about fire, but we're not talking about the fire that you light in an oven. We're talking about a, a, a fire that you couldn't imagine in this world. So this is the idea of heaven and hell in Islam. How do you get there? The first tenet to get into heaven is to have the right belief. You've got to recognize your creator. You've got to believe in Allah. You've got to believe in the one that created you. Uh, but that's not enough. It's not. It's not free. You got to do good deeds. You got to be a good person. You got to earn the mercy of your of your Lord, so that they, Allah can forgive us and enter us into heaven. 
So that's a short answer to a very beautiful question. But if you have more, uh, I'm here for more questions. If you want to continue, you guys are all welcome to come to the mosque, any mosque. All our mosques are open. We don't have any kind of memberships or secret societies or handshakes or anything like that. Yeah. Yes? Um, I just had a comment regarding the last question. So in Islam, it's not like because a person acts a certain way, then like they're going to go to hell or they're going to heaven. Or they're going to heaven. It's not something that a human being can determine. Instead, that's why we believe in the Day of Judgment where God will judge. And we say that only God knows what's in the hearts. So regardless of a person, like, I don't know, like, being a prostitute, for example, you know, only God can judge her or him. And at the end of the day, like, we as human beings don't know who's going to heaven or hell or who is a believer or a non-believer just because, you know, what they look like or the actions that they do. So I feel like that's a really important thing. I got a question, and I've heard some people may go to hell but you're serving out kind of like a was it a penance you're going to be there for a, for a punishment but you're not there eternally so you'll be there for however long and then you're forgiven and brought back up is that another thing or was i uh did i misunderstand that and that's all depending, I know everyone will say, it, um, Allah, knows, uh, uh, Allah knows best. So, but is that another thing like, you may start off in hell, but you have, it's like a prison in a way, you have time to serve and then you're forgiven and you're, you're brought up. Am I right on that? And if I may, and if I may add to what you're saying. Absolutely. Because the judge is Allah. Your permission to be a teacher, you know? So the judge is, is Allah, our judge is the God, you know? You don't want to make a partnership with the Creator to judge. But we are here as Muslims to invite ourselves and all of you to the true way of life. I have to tell you that because we have, you know how you have guidelines in every situation? Right here, you have your syllabus. Here's your syllabus. If you're, if you're, if you're tardy twice, you're gone, you know? So, I would like to offer, we have the copy of the meaning of English Quran. We have some limited, please take them with you and keep them with you. And we have also a brief illustrative guide to understanding Islam, which has also some scientific things that we discussed as well. Please don't hesitate to take those and make it easy for us to carry them back to the car. <laughs> and please, again, I mean, just to end, make sure you take something, make sure you read, Make sure you ask questions. Their brothers here, their sisters here. You can get their emails. You get their address so that at least we can start building these bridges. We can start clearing up this confusion. We can start knowing what really Islam is. Otherwise, if you look at the way society is going, people are trying to make a clash between civilizations that doesn't exist. So the only way to stop that is actually learn. So I invite everybody. Don't leave without taking something with you taking some contact. If you want to know more about Muslim women, there are Muslim women here. Get their number, get their, ask them, why do they cover, what do they believe in? They can tell you better than me. You know, there are Muslim brothers here. If you want to know more about brothers and why we have cool beards, you can get somebody to, uh, no, we're not like Dynasty fans, but, you know, you can get them. although I like the show, but uh, you, can, you can get emails and addresses and uh, you can get to know. So, thank you very much. Okay. Well, Okay, well, I hope I was able to answer some of your questions. Um, that was me. A lot of people don't know that. I wore a cardigan before it was cool. Mr. Rogers. All right. What else does it say? All right, it says I wore cardigans before it was cool. All right. Well, I've I've done some videos tonight, and it is it is bedtime, and I am tired. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this here. Hope you enjoyed. I did. He didn't answer my questions though, jerk. <laughs> but somebody in the comments will, so it'll be fine. So until next time, have a good day. Have a good night.